processes and tools dominate today's Agile discussions, but we are devoted to the individuals and interactions that make it work. From the beginner to the veteran practitioner, we have something for you. Welcome to Agile for Humans. All right, welcome to this week's episode of Agile for Humans. I'm your host, Ryan Ripley. Joining me tonight, my partner in crime, my co-presenting experimentee, experimentor, co-conspirator, if you ask some people, Amitai Schleyer. Conspirator mentor. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's right. Amitai, how are uh, you, sir? Yes. I am well. Uh, partner in crime across state boundaries. Doing well. Wonderful. Also joining us tonight, UX product Engineering genius, John Cutler. John, <laughs> how are you, sir? I'm good. How are you doing? Hey, I'm excited. I've been a big follower follower of your writings. I've really enjoyed many of the drawings and ideas that you put out. So just super excited that... Uh, well, first of all, Amitai made the, the ask and got you on the show. So I think, Amitai, you are neck and neck with Don Gray now for booking agent. I've always wanted to neck with Don Gray. <laughs> I that, think where did, <laughs> <We're in there. laughs> you're gonna cut that out right nope that's staying in <laughs> but john amitai, it, i think that we met uh amitai and i met we're in like a hotel lobby in raleigh where i crashed sure. an app an after party uh after conference set of beers with uh man woody was there yeah woody llewellyn and then, llewellyn right. oh my god that was uh-huh. that was amazing that was Great an crowd. awesome afternoon. Yeah, it was good. That sounds so. like a super group. So I, I'd imagine that was a pretty uh, exciting, but probably also tiring conversation. Oh man, these people are like my. I mean, I'm I'm a little weird in this too. I'm sort of a combination fanboy, and I mean, I was just I couldn't. I think I'm here talking to these people. That was exciting. I drove out there for that, and Woody just tweeted and said, "Come on out!" And then there everyone was sitting around having beers. So. That was uh, that was awesome for me. Oh, it sounds great. So, for the listeners not familiar with John, um, you know, definitely a UX product specialist, uh, does a lot of writing online. Posted some articles that you know Amitai and I had been talking about. Uh, the first idea, and it's one that is kind of hits home for me, is the idea of a feature factory. So, John, for the people out there, I don't I don't want you to read your post, but. For those people out there that aren't quite familiar with the term feature factory or the distinction it makes, could you walk through that real quick? And then perhaps we'll, uh, we'll go through a few ideas around that. Sure. Um, so a feature factory is more of a sensation that someone might feel when they're inside it. And, and the, way, the reason why I bring that up is there's situations where you might be delivering a lot of features quickly that don't feel like a feature factory. They feel very effective. You see a lot of impact in your work. So what I would boil it all the way down to is a feature factory is an environment where the participants, the frontline people in the environment, don't sense the impact of what they're doing. They don't sense that this stuff is changing people's lives or making the company money, or having an impact. And an engineer described it to me best once. He asked me once as a product person, what are your passing tests? How do you know that this thing is working? How do you know that this is having impact? Because we're pouring our heart out into this, and it seems like this stuff just goes out into the ether, and we don't know if it works. So, you know, in the post, I go through many, many points, but I've boiled it down to that recently, which is, it's a feature factory is an environment that you're in where you're working your ass off and everything is going in one direction and you have no idea if it's changing anyone's life and you have no idea if it's working. Um, and and I'd, I'd boil it down to that. So a friend of the show, Kalpesh Shaw, he has a talk called Don't Be a, a Backlog Lumberjack. And what that <laughs> refers to are these th- are these teams that are just chopping through features but never finding out if anything that they're doing is actually valuable. And I have a feeling this yep. is very similar to the, to the feature factory idea that you're talking through. Uh, I find, so, so to bring this to kind of a practical example, I think a practical example and the many times that I've seen a feature factory uh, emerge is when it was uh, development by contract. And what I mean is there was a big upfront contract for these are the capabilities that thou shalt deliver and here are the things that they may do, but it's typically very vague. 
It's typically hard to pin down, but it, what it does is create a buffer between the development team and the customer. So instead of asking the customer for feedback, they refer to the contract. And these features go into the ether. Now, the, the downside of the feature factory, it, 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 has this, it has this illusion of efficiency, right? We know what we want. We'll just plow through it. But John, am I right in thinking that uh, a big downside of this is that a lot of expectations go unmet, a lot of needs go unmet, and uh, there's typically significant rework in, in a feature factory? Well, I, I mean, in some ways, you're lucky if you have the rework, right? I mean, rework might even signal that you um, are listening to your customers, right? <laughs> right. So in, in, in a worst case scenario, and, and I use the term Project Tetris or Team Tetris. It's the same thing. You know, th there is a mastermind sitting over there looking at their resources and trying to fit every single little project in there so that everything can go out the door. And once you're done with one thing, you get turned on to the next thing. And it's, I think it's really interesting. You know, I, I've talked to a lot of UX folks and engineers, and if you mention the concept of an MVP, they all start screaming at you as a product owner. And, and I've, I always ask them, well, what are you screaming about? And they'll say, oh, no, we know this trick. We, we know what you're, you're doing here. This is an MVP. And to me, MVP means ship something crappy and then run away. Right. So what I learned when I actually asked them, like, what problem, what, what are, what's making you anxious? What, what needs am I not going to help you with here as your product owner? They didn't believe me that we were going to continue on this quest to make this good. And that's why I brought up that point about rework in the beginning. That, so I think as a, as a practical byproduct of this, um, you will be celebrated in your company for being having high velocity and for being very responsive and the engineering team will get pats on the back and everyone will see everyone's doing a great job. And this can go on for years in a company until all that unvalidated complexity in your product bubbles up to then kill the company. And then what happens is the company starts buying other companies. They start working around the complexity in the product. They start uh, having problems with reliability and stability in the product. So you really see the net effect of the feature factory, not in the short term, because everyone thinks it's great. You see it in the mid to longer term as you, as you start to see. And, and frankly, you have attrition problems with your employees because your best people care about impact. And your best engineer, your best UX person sees through this in two seconds, and they can find some small problems to deal with in the short term or get really wrapped up in the technical problem. But I have had the most senior engineers turn around to me and say, I, I can't work here anymore. This, this is a cool technical problem, but I can solve many cool technical problems. I'm not changing people's lives. I'm not making a great product. So I have an example from my experience that I wonder, uh, I definitely made it under my control, less like a feature factory than it had been. But I wonder how well it qualifies for the definition that you're thinking of. So the example in my experience was I came into uh, a legacy code project where we were delivering things with some, some lead time, usually on the order of three to six months is when we could get another shipment of our code out. Uh, and so at best, if you had a request and it became the top of our queue, Three to six months from now, we'll, we'll have that in production. And it wasn't a smooth process. There were lots of regressions. I gradually got it under test. And the thing that I found as the cornerstone of making it less like a feature factory, in my understanding, is that we, we switched over to TDD. And that made it possible, uh, after half a year of getting things under test, to move forward uh, at a pace that we could ship more frequently. Because we had more assurance, we didn't have to wait for, for long releases, we had the confidence to do it sooner. So we were able to release more often because we had test coverage and protection. And because we released more often, all of a sudden, stuff on the backlog and requests from customers matter to them more because they get something back in an amount of time that they can remember. And so there's, there's a couple things there. Customers that previously would give up and not bother asking because it would take too long, they're interested again. And customers that did have a request and put it in recently and got it out recently... Uh, it's it's worth it to them to put it in use and get feedback to us, and it's worth it to us to take that in. So that changed the game when we got that test coverage in place. But I wonder what would have you know what would have been a next step to make that even less like a feature factory. I I think that's a great point because I think that it, we traded some some skypes before about craftsmanship, and I think that there is almost certainly craftsmanship enables 
uh, velocity, but then velocity becomes uh, a velocity of learning, right? So I think that the next step there is, I mean, look, in, the, in, the, in commercial products these days, fast is table stakes. It's scary, but it's true, right? So, you know, you, you kind of do need to be able to move with some type of velocity. But the next step, once you've, you've tackled that, is now you've started to get your batch sizes smaller and smaller, is think about what done means to the right of your Kanban board, right? Like, what does done mean? And then you add that next item, achieved outcome or achieve desired customer outcome. And that's a very subtle change, but it means a whole lot, right? And and it's I think that you bring up a good point. This doesn't happen all at once, right? So the next step would have been, hey, we're working on this feature. What what how will it change the world? How will it change our customers' world? Put that outcome to the right side of the, the board and then start tracking how many items are sitting there waiting to be validated. What? So I would mm-hmm. say that no, go ahead. Yeah, right. No, I, I was just going to say that the technical side is important, and I think tracking the outcome is important. But one of the, I think one of the best things I ever did on a team was actually just say, so let me step back. Morale was low. the The senior people were very unhappy. We were a total feature feature factory. Like all we did was was plow out these features, ship them to prod. Never saw any impact. Mm-hmm. One of the best things we ever did was just take a field trip to to a customer site. And, and have the customer present the tool uh, to the development team and, and just talk about uh, the impacts that it's having on the company. And I, you know, a lot of people gravitate towards get the tests in place, make, you know, start dealing with the tech debt, start dealing with some of the, the bad decisions we've made. But, and, the, and those are important. So it's, it's not a yes, but it's a yes and. Uh, get them in front of a customer, have the customer talk about the, uh, how that tool and those features are impacting the lives. And I've never seen a better way to re-energize a team than, than just that. And I think it's exactly where you're going too, John. Yep. I mean, I had the pleasure of working um, at a company. I, I don't know if, I, maybe she's been on the show, Heidi Helfand, and she's an agile coach in Southern California. And, and she was the first agile coach, like real agile coach that I met and I worked with. And, and she fostered such a wonderful environment in, in a community there, in a product community. But we had the flexibility to take road trips with customers, um, to customers with engineers. And I'll always tell a story that um, we were there with the engineers and we had had a lot of requests about being able to manage keys keys and and it didn't really sink in until the engineer saw like a wall with 4000 keys on it that it truly sunk in how big of a problem it was but what was fascinating is instead of just building a database of keys it really spurned the ideas of what would it look like if property managers didn't need to have keys at all what would it look like if they could do showings by unlocking a door with their phone what if they could do these types of things? So it just had this marvelous impact on engaging people. And one thing I would say is a lot of UX people and product people get engaged in this whole landing the 747 on an aircraft carrier. Do all the work beforehand. Try to figure this thing out. Try to get all the context to the team. And part of getting out of the feature factory is allowing yourself to have a messy kickoff for, a, for an effort, Right. You know, it's okay if a week or two goes by and you have to take people in a van on site to talk to customers. It's okay if it's hands off keyboards for a little while, right? It's okay to be messy because what we would see is that the end outcomes for the work we did were so much better. Um, so, yep, Amitai. I was going to come when you ended, but I'll, that seems like you ended. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. when Ryan said earlier that, uh, it seems like there's a, a, a layer of abstraction or just some kind of insulation between the people who churn out the code and the people who evaluate whether it helped them or not. Uh, that seems like maybe the determining factor or a really strong determining factor for whether what you have is a feature factory, that these two parties can't tell what each other are doing or communicate directly with each other. It also seems like a thing that tends to happen in an organization unless you make sure that it doesn't. So what are some ways you've seen teams or organizations move from having that abstraction to not having it and those people working directly. Well, and while John thinks about that, I just want to make sure we're, we're clear too that if you're in a feature factory right now, celebrate the fact that you're shipping, right? <laughs> I, I don't go back to work tomorrow and, and start in on, oh, 
ho hum, we're not a great team, we're a feature factory. You're writing code, you're shipping software. All we're advocating for is now adding that that last piece in and, and validate that you're delighting your customer. Right? Yep. So the, the manifesto, our first principle, continuous continuous delivery of valuable software that delights our customer. That's our, our top goal, correct? Well, you don't know that unless you check in. So all we're saying is take the next step. You're doing great by shipping. Now make sure you're delighting. You know, that that is actually it. I thought I had the answer to the first question, but that brings up the other thing that I was thinking is that what you typically see is, especially with a lot of UX practices that are very like heavy upfront UX practices, is this idea that you're going to mitigate the risk away and that once that thing gets shipped, no one will ever touch it. So I always ask product managers when I talk at a conference, I'll say, how many of you have actually removed a feature in the last six months? And I would say on average, it's about three to six, you know, three to eight percent of the audience says that they have removed a feature. So the interesting thing there is, and I think this goes, you know, to some of the modern agile stuff around safety or just trust between teams is that a lot of these handoffs are kind of trust proxies in a way. It's like, we'll do our part, you do your part. And one of the things about outcomes is they can be kind of scary. And if you start worrying about the outcomes and if you start saying, well, uh, if what, what happens if this doesn't produce the outcome? Do we get fired? You know, are we a bad team if we don't do that? It really starts at the core with trust and safety because people assume the opposite of the feature factory is analysis paralysis. And if you're an executive, if you're a C-level person and someone says, well, we're going to do this analysis or we're going to ship. If I'm a C-level person, we just ship, please. So the I would to answer the practical level is you have to create the safety that you can do these handoffs and take part in outcome-driven approach and not blame anyone for having a bad outcome. You need to open up the possibilities of taking stuff out of production that doesn't have the success that you thought it would and learn from that, learn from the failure, learn from you know what did you learn from that being out there. And you need to frame this because when you're, in, when you're working in the anti-feature factory, you're still shipping just as much, right? It, you're just shipping things that you might be pulling. You might be shipping smaller batches. You might be doing more learning. You might be releasing to fewer customers. So one of the first steps is to get away from the idea that the opposite of the feature factory is analysis paralysis, I would say. I don't know. That's a whole like load of words, but do, do you kind of get what I'm saying? I do, and it also makes me think... Uh you know, a, a, a diagnostic test for whether you're, you've graduated beyond Feature Factory is if you know what the faces of your customers look like before and after they use yeah. your feature. Yep. I, certainly for me, uh, on the occasions as a developer that I've had a chance to see emotionally what this did for the person that I made it for or one of the people that I made it for is, is everything that I live for. Even if it's not the face I hope to see, that's still what I want to know. Uh, yeah. And I... I abhor operating in a vacuum where it's just code. Code isn't that interesting to me. I love programming, but I can do it without anybody else's time being wasted. You know, <laughs> I can do that on my own. If I'm doing something that's supposed to help somebody else solve a problem or make them feel a certain way or help them operate a certain way, I want to know what happened for them when I tried. Hey, everybody. Ryan Ripley here. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, more with John and Amitai for a conference that gives you customized learning options to explore Agile and beyond? Attend Agile Dev East, the premier Agile event taking place November 5th through the 10th in Orlando, Florida, covering the latest techniques and topics no matter your level of adoption. Immerse yourself in hot topics such as Agile and Lean development principles and practices, scaled Agile development, Agile teams and leadership, digital transformation, and more. As an added bonus, the event is co-located with Better Software and DevOps East conferences, your one registration automatically gives you access to all three programs. This means you can choose from over 100 learning and networking opportunities to build a customized week of learning that fits you and your organization's specific needs. Be inspired by veteran keynote speakers, in-depth tutorials, topically driven concurrent sessions, networking events, and more to develop skills, supercharge knowledge, and re-energize your career growth. Explore the program at well.tc forward slash agile. Agile for Humans listeners use the code AFH20 by July 21st to receive 20% off any registration package over $800 in addition to super early bird pricing. 
Check that out at well.tc forward slash agile. That code again is AFH20. You know, w- one thing that that uh, reminds me of, a, I was working at a company as a UX researcher, and during a customer conference, I actually did what I call the confessional booth for customers. And I said to them, look, we couldn't invite the 100 plus engineers here, uh, although they would have loved to be here. Um, but but we're going to shoot some videos. And we shot these little vignette videos, like 10 or 15 minute long videos. And I thought to myself, you know, maybe someone will just look at the first couple minutes and maybe this wouldn't be that exciting. But that was, um, at least as it was described to me, that was an extremely valuable thing for empathy building and kind of getting this sense of impact. And people keep referring to those videos now, you know, a long time later. So sometimes exa- you're exactly right, Amitai. It's it, in lieu of that, there's plenty of things that as an engineer, you could probably dig your head into. But when given that and provided that, you really see people get super excited. Well, it, another experience around that. So during a, a product demonstration, so a, a 70 person program uh, had not really seen real feedback from a customer. They, uh, they wanted to know what was going on. They were, they're, they're, they're critically interested. I think as John, you pointed out in the opening that this is something they want to see the impact. And that when you, when they can't see the impact, it really does have an, have an effect. Well, we did a, a product demo. And so it was really like a, a release with uh, the customer in the room, being able to see the, the application, getting to use it for the first time, which was amazing considering it was many, many months of development work. And by asking you know, a simple question, can we live stream this? So in a different room, you know, in, in, back in the program room or the program area, on a monitor, the, t- the 70 people watched our, our product lead give a demo and then watched the customer use the app. And it was, everyone was captivated. Like you mm-hmm. couldn't pull people away from these screens if you tried because they were finally seeing uh, which button they would click to advance a, a pagination screen or, or how they were actually inter- interacting with some of the drag and drop elements that we had been guessing about for months. And it was... It's just so important. Like even the, the, the confessional booth type activities that you're talking about, the little vignettes, the, the videos, anything, even if you can put it in your application, you know, if you can put a, a click sense in, in your app to test out what the workflow is and how they're using your app, this is all information that, that your engineers, your developers, your product people, your business analysts, they need this stuff just not only to motivate them, but this is how you how you launch and create and and maintain great products. Yep. Um, you know the the thing, uh, and ag- again, it's sort of it's difficult describing prior situations and knowing that in some people's environment they are literally not allowed to get in touch with a customer. Um, when I talk to product teams for the first time, I say, "Could I pick up the phone right now and call a customer and schedule a demo right now?" Or could I test a prototype with someone? Or could I do those things? And so I acknowledge there's some situations in like heavily, you know, compliant environments where that might not be possible to do that. What I do find in certain organizations is there's a lot of rules and a lot of talk around it. But the the, the subtext is, oh, my God, how could we ever let that person talk to these wacky, crazy engineers that we have here? You know, so I, I would urge people in in even if you build a small customer research group of, you know, maybe 10, 15 customers, like people who you build that relationship with it, even if you have to get legal sign off or whatever, having those people involved earlier on, not just when you've shipped it, you know, every week. And and I've been on teams that could have an idea and a prototype and a customer using it within four hours in in production. And the ability to do that, people think that that's just, you know, Star Wars and it's just in the movies. But when you actually feel that happen, you understand the power that you have there, which goes a lot to the DevOps stuff. It goes a lot to other things, to the legal side or compliances code or any of those particular, like anything you need to do to be able to make that possible can be amazing for your product. So we do have a question that's come in from the Twitter hotline. Amitai put... A, uh, put a feeler out to the Agile for Humans community, and we did have a question come in from David Kuntz, uh, at David A. Kuntz on Twitter. So, John, is the creative UX community in a similar place as software development was in the 1990s? 
And what he, what he means by this is searching for lighter weight processes to increase value delivery. Oh, wow. I mean, it's, that could be a whole podcast. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, it's actually interesting. I, I don't know. I am not like an agile historian or something like that. So the best I can, I can say is there was a time there, it seemed like in the late 2000s, where, where UX, its primary challenge was trying to figure out how to even play with these iter- uh, you know, iterating teams. And you'd see a lot of different talks about it. You know, do you do dual phase? Do you do dual track? You know, how do you, how do you quote unquote, get a seat at the table? So I don't want to go uh, too in-depth to the question, but I would say that UX has been struggling since that point to, you know, maybe the, you know, maybe 2014 to 2016, thinking about questions like that. I think the addition of the ideas around lean UX and other things have meant that we've sort of moved on from that existential UX problem of um, how do we even play in this environment to actually being considered a partner in the environment. And, you know, the, the telling sign to me is when I work with engineers who say, that they won't even start working on the problem until a UX person is involved because they, they view that person as a very strong partner. So I'm not sure if it answers the question, but I would say that the UX has had to go through a progression from just even figuring out how to deal with it to having a lot of impact and sometimes even guiding the process, you know, things like design thinking or lean UX sometimes is how iteration is being structured at the moment with things like design sprints or other stuff. So I don't know, I, th- I see a lot of advancement there. So as a, as a follow-up to that question, and thank you, David Kuntz, for that, that question that came in through Twitter, um, what can a struggling UX, UI person do who's trying to integrate into an iterative team like a, a Scrum or, 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 or a Kanban-type setup? What, what's the advice that you typically give when you, you get on site and you see some dysfunction? Well, I think we discussed one of it, get, get the customer on the phone, <laughs> yeah, right? You know, sure. like start... Listen, I, I always say to teams of engineers and, and UX people, like, would if you control the budget, would you hire this person? You know, and so I kind of think that what often happens with UX is they've been seen as only the prototype builder, or you know, they're the person who's going to figure it out ahead of time. And the I would advise that person to figure out how to pair up, show the skills that you have, sit do rapid prototyping with an engineer right next to you. Get the context of the customer in the next couple hours. Do tests. Invite the team to your usability tests. Do whatever you can because if all you are is a wireframe, you know, monkey, then the team is going to view you as that and they're going to view you as someone who is always an obstruction. So this stereotype of UX is they're always into like the pixel perfect um, part of the flow that's not really like most UX people. UX people want an outcome. They want the user to like get a pleasurable outcome and and they want the interface to work. So I don't know. I would just have a sit down with the UX person and try to say it's kind of up to you to show why you're valuable in this environment. Yeah, I think those are great tips. You know, to team up or pair up with the engineers, you know, and engage the customers very basic things, but it's something that I think you're right, that, that the UX, UI community has had a hard time plugging into. I think those two steps alone could probably move teams very for, very or, or much further ahead than, uh, than where they are today. So thank you for that. Yep. No, and even if the honest is on a UX person to show why they're valuable to their, you know, their programmer teammates or what have you, uh, it doesn't seem like it should be very hard. If they're really outcome focused and the goal is really on the part of everybody else on this team to deliver those outcomes, then it should be a pretty easy sell. Uh, yep. You know, you, you don't just want to write code so that the code is done. You want to write code so that the person on the other end succeeds. So let me help you with that. Yeah, exactly. We should want that. That should be pretty easy. <laughs> yeah. To the drifters, makers, why askers and systems thinkers, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> By John Cutler. <laughs> uh, and so what I took away from this at a quick read was uh, you, John, personally, don't feel like any one role in a team suffices to describe you and what you bring. Is that a fair characterization? Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, it, it's... I told uh, you, we were talking about beforehand about 
you know, I write a lot of these medium posts sometimes. And this had been one that I had been trying to punt on for a while because I thought I quote unquote needed to get it right. And then I just thought, you know, I'm just going to get this out there um, because I, I, I say it in the first line, I'm kind of looking for my tribe, right? I'm looking for these other folks and I, I, I think they're out there. Um, and it's, and it's nice to talk with them. And, and to be honest, a lot of these experiences that I've been at a conference or been at an open Agile event or Agile 2015, I, I feel that these are my people. And they might be more engineering focused or they might be more coaching focused. They might be more systems thinking focused or org design focused. But I think that we're out there and I get such a buzz when I'm talking to people who work who who s- sort of identify with this thing, and so, you know, that's that was the effort here to kind of come to, almost come to peace with it with myself as well. That it, it's okay to not necessarily fit in these buckets, and it it's okay if you, you know, write classical music and you're an engineer, you know, and sort of, for me, play if it. anybody would. That. I can't imagine anyone. That would yeah, that. who's who's that particular person? So, you know, that that's what I was getting at. I think that I was also trying to, again, come to peace with it, but also describe what this messy, this this messy feeling feels like sometimes when you're not, you're not a manager, right? And at the same time, when you're on the team, you're also observing it from a systems level. And and I can only kind of defer to you guys. Maybe you you're much better to talk of this that. The, the, what coaches do in their ability to sort of stay in the here and now while also kind of seeing the matrix and seeing the system around it is something that I'm absolutely in awe of because I struggle with that every day because I'm in the here and now, but I see the systemic issues. I see the kind of ebbs and flows of the organization at the same time. And it can be very difficult to stay in the here and now when you see that. And and maybe you guys have more experience in that area. You know, so how do you stay in the here and now when you can see all the system dynamics in a company and what's happening? Interesting. I was going to say I have the opposite problem. We talked about this on a past podcast with uh, Zach Boniker and Diane Zajac Woody. Uh, a note that I leave for myself on the monitor or in the front of my brain is to get out of right now. Interesting. I'm a dog. I'm <laughs> I'm experiencing right now extremely strongly, and anything that isn't right now, not at all, except when I remember to pay attention to it. <laughs> so my job with my personality is to remember to pay attention to things that are not seen and that are not present. Interesting. So for me, that is an intellected behavior. It is not my default behavior. So I have <laughs> the opposite. So one answer would be, I should pair with you, and you should pair with me, and then we would cover all the bases. Yep. How about you, Ryan? Oh. I- I've learned through being intentional uh, how to shift gears. And so I try to um, have some awareness of where I need to be. And so if I'm in a a very tactical type of situation, I try to be in the here and now and present so that we can work through this one issue. But I always, at the end of each day, and this has been a practice that has served me pretty well, I just try to write. Uh, I I have a train ride home, and so I pull out a notebook or I pull out the laptop I write about the day, and if it was a tactical kind of day, I just try to reflect on how strategically it impacts us at 3, 6, 12 months, whatever the duration is appropriate for the project. If it was more of a strategic planning day, I try to figure out how we're going to be tactical about some of the things we talked about. So if I'm spending my day in one mode, I'm intentionally trying to sit down and write about the opposite mode as I reflect on the day so that I don't lose sight of it. Mm. Uh, and, And that has served me pretty well, and it's actually helped me prepare for the next day. Because typically, I've sp- if I've spent one day in a certain mode, I need to get back to the opposite mode relatively quickly to actually work work on or work through, depending on which gear we're going to go into, uh, those topics the next day. So I, I, I don't know if that's you know, helpful or not, but it's something that's helped me. For me, it's helpful. And then, John, I'm curious to hear for you. Uh, for me, it's helpful because it ties into a concept that I've had that has been validated so far about how I can operate as a coach at all when I'm coming from a development background. I always imagined, like it says in the manifesto, that I should alternate between doing it and helping others do it and doing it and helping others do it. That if I stay in the coach role and the helping others do it, even if my hands are on the keyboard, if it's not my team, if it's not my deadline, I am gradually floating away from having advice that should be believed. 
<laughs> I haven't been in the fire. I don't know how true this is anymore. Back in my day, I don't want to be there. I don't want to be that guy. So, uh, so for me, I always imagined that I should switch at some point back to being a practitioner in a team where the deadline is my responsibility. And Ryan, uh, what you're saying also appeals in the sense of uh, moving between these two layers of abstraction of being in it and then noticing when you've been in it too long and observing it and observing it. And when you've been observing it too long, get back in it. So that, uh, that matches my mental model for myself. Well, I, John, actually, what do you think well, you I was going to say, I'm going to tell you real quick. Yeah. I actually follow your, your practice. So I just finished up a a two-year stint a little while ago as a director in a a management position at a very large company. Now I'm back trying to coach uh, management and teams uh, on agile practices. And my career is kind of a winding... I was explaining this to someone just the other day that I wind in and out of management roles because when I don't want to stay in one forever, like my goal is not to shoot to the top and be a a vice president and drive the Audi and have a lake house. And that's not my, that's not my path. It's a good path. And I'm perhaps I'm nuts for not wanting it, but I really want to get in work in a role, uh, have empathy for that role again, understand the struggle of that role again, and then get out of it and get back into an agile coaching role to where I can help those people because I have a a shared understanding with them. But when I no longer, when I no longer have empathy for them, and when I start feeling bitterness or, or some kind of skepticism or some kind of cynicism towards them, I know it's time for me to get back into that role that I'm trying to coach and spend a little time back in those shoes because I've lost touch with what the work actually is. Mm. You know, it's, it's uh, one thing that you said resonated with me too, and I think that this is something where I, I've connected with a lot of people about this, is this... A lot of us don't want to ascend through management, right? We that, That's not our particular goal. And I've, I've noticed that a lot of coaches and some and some POs even, you know, that the, the, I like staying in the thick of it. I, I was at a company and I, I started a crowdsourced newsletter called From the Front Lines. That's totally what I care about. Like, I want to stay there kind of at the front lines and doing that. And I think that... Um, but at the same time, you know, I kind of, when I'm on the front lines, I sense that larger system. I see that impact. You know, one thing that's always challenging for me with a team is that when the blockers are outside the team, you know, and the, you're in a retro and the blockers that are discussed are outside the team, it always causes like a, a fair amount of anxiety with me as I try to think about how I'm going to work with that. Because that idea that those things can have such an incredible impact on the team, but be sort of outside of the scope of control for the team is, is again, something that I think that uh, you guys as sort of seasoned coaches, you're able to shut that off. But as the sort of like, as a person on the front lines, I'm that PO or someone in the retro who says to you, why, why, why can't that change? Why, (laughs) why? Well, and that's the right question. Uh, Right. So for me, I struggle with that that mindset as well. So I, you know, woe is woe is me. This is outside of my control. I can't act on this. And I, I took, I finally, this is the year that I decided to kind of deal with that mentality and mindset. So I'm actually uh, a part of Christopher Avery's responsibility process program, and, and really taking those lessons to heart and learning that all of these things that we think are happening to us, we're actually causing them. Or in one, or if we're not causing them, we can be responsible for our response to them. And and I find that taking that mindset has actually helped me in a number of ways with these types of, of roadblocks. I think a lot of the time, the, these these impediments or roadblocks were actually uh, unvoiced expectations, which inevitably have to turn into disappointment and anger, because they are unvoiced expectations. And I find that. You know, and I'm sure you, this is nothing new to you guys, but just making these things visible uh, is typically enough to get rid of a lot of them. Now, there are situations where the impediments are very, very real, and uh, they are outside of our control, and we can't just wish them away. But I have found that um, through intent, uh, because it is a natural process to actually have this thinking of this is outside of us, we can't be effective about around this, or through this, or or with this, whatever the impediment is. But I'm finding that through this practice of responsibility and what Christopher Avery uh, teaches, uh, we've been able to, to get through a lot more of these roadblocks 
in, in a much more powerful way. You know, it's it's funny because I think that that's m- maybe a good test for the tribe that I'm talking about is for me, it makes perfect sense to go up to a big portfolio board for the whole company and start taking a ball of string and then just putting all the dependencies between it. Like it and and actually, you know, without getting too personal, I think this has a lot to do with our family background and how we grew up. And if you grew up in a certain environment, I think it's it's comforting for you to air all the problem, the, the problem. It's it's actually feels better for you to expose the dysfunction so that you can start trying to work with it. And I think that other, um, you know, and, and actually what I would add is, is sometimes some less than functional environments. If you're a kid growing up in that environment, you feel that if, if, if your parents or whoever, if everyone could just see everything and understand everyone and everyone could see eye to eye on this, that there would be some outcome that could be happy to do those things. And so one thing that's interesting, you know, without getting too deep into it, is that as coaches and people working in this, I think, you know, we have to understand that stuff has an impact. So the person who feels comfortable going and putting all the balls of string up on the, the, the portfolio board and saying, guys, you have so many dependencies, that's the bottleneck there. The comfort that I have doing that is actually born on some level of, you know, uh, some need, right? Like I have a need to expose the system to itself. Other people are very, very comfortable not exposing the system to itself and not because they're nefarious or because they have bad intentions. They just don't think they, they see their role more as navigating through the system versus exposing it to itself. And so I would say that, I mean, you know, the, the larger thing here is neurodiversity, right? That we all come with our baggage into these environments. And so sometimes I think that that's maybe one of the elements of this post for me is coming to peace with that. Right, like coming to peace that that's my particular instinct to um, want to work through it with the. I have actually have an extremely high tolerance for 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 craziness. I mean, I toured around the country in in a van with a bunch of you know um, crazy semi alcoholic uh, musicians, and you know everything was messed up all the time. But I sort of I thrived in that environment as long as people could somehow talk about it, right? Uh, so I think that we all come with those, um, we all come with a little bit of baggage into how we see systems and things. But I think you've also hit on, uh, something that I've learned this year as well is that we really can't coach other people until we figure our stuff out. And I think coming to terms with that stuff is just so empowering. So I think that was a really great post, John. And it was one of those that I hope, you know, all the coaches out there take a look at and just realize that, like you said, we all have a different brain chemistry. We have different wirings. You know, mine is the, is the opposite. Um, you know, my, not to get too deep into it, but it's perhaps in, in, in my background, it's better not to expose the system to itself. And so now it's something that I intentionally try to do because I understand the impacts of not doing that. And so mm-hmm. it's a kind of a different, it's a similar outcome, but a different motivation and it can lead to a different a path of getting there. But I think just understanding that about ourselves and understanding our own tendencies and having that awareness and then also some of that um, some of that training around responsibility in some other areas, we get ourselves figured out or at least ourselves to a, a place where we we're accepting of all of these these uh, wirings and, and hang ups and, and all these different uh, habits. We get some awareness around them, we accept them, and I think we start to thrive. So I think it is a really inspiring post, and I hope that we'll get some links. We'll get links up to that one in the Future Factory one in the show notes. But it's one of those that could be very empowering to a coach, you know, looking to to really crack into what could make them incredibly effective. It definitely spoke to me loudly. Uh, I've been trying to figure out as I transition into independent consulting and coaching. What's my angle? What, is, what makes me the person you want to hire instead of somebody else? Thinking of myself almost as a product to tie it back into product management. And uh, I have a hard time putting a finger on what that angle is unless it's something like I help people orient themselves in their problem spaces. doesn't matter what kind of problem space. doesn't matter what kind of people. Uh, if you're in a problem space and you're trying to swim your way to figure out which way is up and then which way is maybe forward and take a step, I can help you see that and I can help you try taking that step and sort of stochastically work toward whatever way is out for you. Um, But that's not really an angle. It's a pretty soft thing. So to see the vulnerability in your post about who you are and in some ways kind of similar to how I am, 
Uh, I wonder if vulnerability is one of the tricks, if it's even a trick, one of the tools that allows you to write so freely and openly and voluminously because you write a lot. Is that part of the toolkit that you have? Oh, I mean, yeah, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, I'm basically having, I'm having the conversation. Uh, let's say if I had that conversation with my loved one, Sharon, every single day, like her head would explode. So it's, it's my way to, to kind of work through the thoughts on it. And it's kind of interesting. It's, it's actually, you know, that particular post, it's also allowing it to be a little bit of a meditation. This is a deep topic, right? I mean, you, you could have read thousands of words on what it feels like to work through these things. And part of it is just letting go, you know, like, hey, I want to create a conversation with people. I, I want to get a couple thoughts out there. I like writing lists sometimes because it helps me organize, you know, what I'm what I'm doing. But I think that for me primarily, it it this is it it is that vulnerability side. It's just saying it doesn't need to be perfect. I'm gonna get it out there. I'm gonna get this conversation going and then see, you know, see where it goes. So I don't know if people I'm hopefully people continue that conversation. I mean I feel like it it impacted people, which is great. And I feel if I could just do that in fifteen minutes and it's not that great of a post hopefully it's more about like a catalyst versus being like a great piece of writing or something. Cause it's not a great piece of writing. It's more like, let's start, put this little spark in people's brain and then let's have a conversation about it. So I, you know, I, I enjoy on Twitter all the time having conversations with people and direct messages and stuff. Um, Cause that's the really valuable part to me. It's not writing the post. It's actually all the little like streams of conversations that happen after the fact. And then going to a conference or something and someone saying, oh, you're the feature factory guy. And I'm like, oh, let's talk about it because I've learned a lot since I wrote that however many months ago. Um, let's keep the conversation going. Yeah, and, and I think that's important and a great place for us to, I think, acknowledge our time bug. So this is uh, the part of the show, John, where we help our guests keep the conversation going with the listeners. Uh, we'd love to hear about... Uh, any websites, your Twitter handle, anything that you have going on that you'd like to get in front of the listeners so that they can continue this conversation with you? Yeah, I think um, Twitter is easy. I wish there were better channels, but it's uh, John Cuttlefish, C-U-T-L-E fish, <laughs> uh, and Medium, uh, where you can find me at, at sort of the same, you know, John Cutler at Medium, you should be able to find me. I you know, it's funny, all this pressure to get your own website going and your own... I, I think I, I bugged Amitai before. How, oh, what's a static site generator? Everyone tells me I got to have a website. And um, I, I, I prefer to keep it simple. So yeah, reach out on Twitter or Medium or I guess LinkedIn occasionally when I can use that, which is it's unusable a lot of times. But when I do use it and take the plunge, I, I connect with people there. And, and that's probably the best, um, the best ways to be in touch. So we'll get links to all of those things in the show notes so the listeners can, can, can continue the conversation. Amitai, what do you have going on? Uh, what's, what's all of your info that people can t contact you at? And uh, how is how's the, the baby project going? Oh, yeah, yeah. This, yeah. this time around, I'm just going to plug, uh, I have a really nice wife, and we're going to have a really nice baby, maybe in about a month uh, at the time of this recording. And uh, I don't have any more conferences scheduled or anything like that. Uh, Ryan and I went out with a bang. <laughs> and uh, um, what I'd like to plug are uh, you can get in touch with me on Twitter at Schmonz, S-C-H-M-O-N-Z. And you can check out my website, schmonz.com. And uh, there are new episodes of Agile in three minutes in the hopper from special guests. So get subscribed to that if you aren't already and take a look. Now, cool. Amitai, we do owe the listeners an update on how we did go out with a bang at Big Apple Scrum Day. So hopefully we get together soon and talk about uh, the craziness that ensued at our session. Wild and crazy. Two wild and crazy guys. <laughs> so, That's John, nice. this was a ton of fun. I hope that you will come back. The, the time flew by. I hope you'll come back and join us many, many times. I think there are just... Uh, you're one of the... You're one of those authentic people out there that I think uh, Amitai and I really enjoy talking to. Uh, you bring a lot of just raw honesty and, and vulnerability to the conversation. I think that really, it just resonates with people and, and just really enjoyed this and hope uh, you'll do this again and again. Sure, I'd love to join you guys. Great. So as for me, your host, Ryan Ripley, I'm not going to plug anything this episode. Just really enjoyed the conversation. 
Uh, just wanted to thank the listeners out there. We're getting, we're starting to get some questions coming in. Uh, we're getting some tweets coming in with uh, topics that listeners would like to hear about. So we're going to start getting some shows teed up specifically around those uh, and start getting some of those questions answered. So that, that'll be pretty exciting. Uh, otherwise, you guys are clearly sh- uh, sharing the show. The numbers continue to go up. I'm just uh, baffled every time I log in, but uh, it's just great to see. And so thank you for being out there. Thank you for listening. Uh, keep the questions coming. We will answer them. There will be some shows coming up uh, specifically dedicated to them. And uh, other than that, I'm your host, Ryan Ripley, saying everyone have a great night. Thanks for listening to Agile for Humans. Let's keep the conversation going. Drop us a question on Twitter at Agile for Humans or visit agileforhumans.com.